What's up, everyone? Hope you all had a blessed Easter. Easter is just beginning. We have 40 days to 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 take in the the incredible things that have happened this past uh, these past holy days in our church. There's so many new Catholics who have now been baptized or received the fullness of the faith, the different sacraments, and who are part of our family now. It's a it's an awesome time. Uh, Jesse, I hope you had a great weekend with the family. You got some rest in, or not so much. Both, you know, it's it's fun being around the grandkids and, you know, and, and uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's all good. But again, uh, e e this Easter Sunday, again, this is such a magnanimous event, John, that it takes us at least eight days to take it in. So today we're in the octave, we're still in the octave of Easter. We are in the octave and we were all in the throes of about getting ready for the, the sacred Easter vigil on Saturday. Uh, in that uh, peaceful uh, preparatory moment, and that's when the news broke, and uh, we had to get into action. And the, the news, which obviously most of you all heard by now, was that on Easter Sunday, although surprisingly, you think everyone would hear about this, although I was talking to a, a Catholic friend uh, yesterday, and I was telling her about like what happened, and she didn't have any idea. So just in case you're not in the know, you need to be in the know, about what the heck happened, and here it goes. So the Biden administration uh, declared on Saturday that Easter Sunday, March 31st, would be the uh, transgender day of visibility, okay? So it, it, it sent a shockwave, not only to Christians across America, but just, you know, uh, uh, but Americans too, because – I, while again, we're gonna get the in the the other side would say that well, it's been around. They've had this day every single year, March thirty first. But here's the deal: it was never raised with such uh, prestige by a sitting president, by a, a executive order to call it a national day of visibility for transgender. And here's the catch: they waited until. To make it to do it when it was Easter Sunday, when March 31st coincided with the holiest day of the year. Jesse, when you where were you when you heard that news and what was your first reaction? My phone was blowing up. Um, I, I was here at my house, family was here from uh my, my children were here, their, my grandkids were here, and my phone just kept uh pinging. And, and I'll tell you the worst part about this is that Joe Biden refers to himself as a devout Catholic. That's the problem. And 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 he chose to tarnish the holiest day of the year with this blasphemous proclamation. If you read the catechism, what he did is blasphemy and sacrilege. And of the Ten Commandments, the Catholic Church has always said, violating the first commandment is the worst. Of all the ten, that's the worst one to violate, and that's exactly what he, what he did. Now, don't get me wrong, as Catholics... We're the first to welcome sinners. I'm a sinner. John's, we're all sinners. And we want to welcome people that are struggling with, with, with whatever sexual disorder that they have. Uh, and, and I can just imagine the pain and suffering that they've undergone, which led them to choose this lifestyle. Some of it ha happens through rape or through sexual abuse. Uh, we don't condemn the persons. But what we do is shame on you, President Biden, because... Easter Sunday is supposed to be focused on the risen Lord. He's the one that brings healing to the body and to the soul and to the psyche. And, and the fact is, uh, by proclaiming this day, Gender Visibility Day, this is, this is using the power of his bully pulpit to, to promote something which, uh, which is uh, promoted by the father of lies. The, the fact of the matter is, the only thing that we should be making visible on Easter Sunday around America and around the world is we have to make Jesus Christ visible again in the flesh. And by the way, that does happen in every single Catholic church. Bam, you nailed it. It, it is. And that's the, the Holy Eucharist, which obviously Jesse is referencing. You know, uh, when I, in my conversation with this this gal, uh, I was telling her about this, what Biden administration did. She obviously was in shock, right? Uh, and she was talking about what what does C for C do? And and we were having that conversation. And one of the things I just I said was like, look, 
to before, what happens is that you have these the secular evil side doing stuff like this. There's a there, we need a Catholic voice in the public square, okay, and to challenge to push back. Obviously, we're not we're not the only ones. There's people like Catholic Vote that do great work too, and others, um, Life Site, etc. But it's we need more Catholic voices pushing back on this. So we you know we release a, a press statement over the weekend, which it's got about sixty five thousand views. It's all over social media. Um, but I'm going to read you just part, parts of that because it kind of really um, uh, it, it shows what what we feel as Catholics across this nation when we heard this. Outrage, scandal, and sadness are some of the reactions acutely felt across the Catholic world today as we celebrate the great feast of Easter. The Biden administration announced yesterday that Joseph B Biden, president of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and laws of the United States. It's interesting, by the way. It's a, you, you heard what I just said. That, that's a direct quote. Biden, Joseph R. Biden Jr., President of the United States, says he's doing this. Well, guess what? In a typical Biden way, the next day, he says, that wasn't really me. That wasn't really me who said that. And, of course, Speaker Mike Johnson was quick to point out, hold on a second. That's actually a greater problem. If that really wasn't you who signed that executive order – then we have a there's a danger in our republic because the president's not the one making the decisions. Which I mean, it's really not hard to see that anyways right now, given Biden's a mental depravity. Right. In any case, let's assume it was really him. President Biden refers to himself as devout Catholic, and yet he chose to tarnish the holy state of the year with his blasphemous proclamation. Let us be, let us be clear, and this is to Jesse's point: as Catholics, we're the first to welcome those struggling with gender confusion. The pain and suffering they must have undergone, which led them to choose this lifestyle, tugs at our heartstring. We don't condemn you, shame you, or wish you harm. Together with the risen Lord, we wish you, this is speaking to the transgender community, uh, healing, restoration, and acceptance of the gender you were given at birth. When God created you, male or female, God does not make mistakes. His love for us is too great for that. The manipulation and false truth spewed out in this proclamation decree is one horrifying lie. It reminds us of why the Lord Jesus nicknamed the devil the father of lies. While man and demon have tried for thousands of years to tarnish and spit upon the image of Christ, no power on earth or below will ever be able to stop the light and energy that breaks forth from the empty tomb. The Amen. real day of visibility is the resurrection of Jesus when Christ became visible again in the flesh after his bloody execution. The statement ends as follows. While the Biden administration and those behind those decree may be gloating with evil joy for the slap this was to all Christians across the country, we at Catholics for Catholics put them on notice. This will trigger a, trigger a massive peaceful response starting here as we retake the public square for Christ. Lastly, we pray for our USCCB that they will address the blasphemy immediately calling upon President of the United States to repent of this action. You know, Jesse, we saw this before. They, they, the other side was playing with fire back in June, right? Um, through the first through Bud Light, Target, and Dodger Stadium, they play with fire, and boy, did they get burnt. And I, I predict the same thing is going to happen here. There's going to be a mass. There already is a massive response. Would you agree? Yeah. And and one good thing is as the Cardinal Wilton Gregory, glad you uh, went there. Yep, uh, he 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 gave kind of a half-hearted, uh, I guess rebuke of, of of what Biden did. He said that uh, that Biden is a cafeteria Catholic. He actually he actually used that in an interview, and he said that Biden does contradict the teachings of the church, some of the teachings of the church. But all in all, then at the end, he went on to say that, but but I think he's a devout and good Catholic or something like that. So that was kind of a half-hearted rebuke. Yeah, I wish it would have been stronger, but at least at least there was a voice from from a from a bishop uh basically calling him out. Now there's stronger voices. Cardinal Mueller and others have called for his excommunication. Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, uh, he's not the only one. There are other very strong voices out there that have said that this guy's crossed the line and he should be excommunicated. Let's go deeper into that whole Wilton Gregory thing because that statement, I mean, it's, yes, we are grateful that he spoke up on this point. At the same time, it's like, okay, the guy has been in favor of killing babies. He already officiated 
officiated at a you know what wedding at the White House before. He's a scandal of the Catholic faith. What's going twice. on at the southern border? Twice. 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 Okay. Yeah. You know, Wilton Gregory, Archbishop Wilton Gregory, is the ordinary that oversees President Washington or you know President Biden there in Washington. He has a responsibility, and so it took him this to speak up. Thankfully, he did. Honestly, when he used that quote, I saw it read in Fox News that Archbishop Wilton Gregory refers to Biden as a cafeteria Catholic. Archbishop, we pray for you that you won't be a cafeteria bishop. And here's what I mean to that. He, this whole uh, you know, press running the press, releasing your token interview, okay, great. But there's canon law I, right over here on my shelf right over there. 915, 915 excommunicate him. And, uh, you know, without knowing the intentions of Wilton Gregory or judging what, what he's thinking, but objectively it seems that the well, this is what the pressure around can do. Like you mentioned um, our, the, the, the Mueller interview, which I encourage people to watch on Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson interviewed uh, um, Cardinal Mueller, right? Um, and people have called for the excommunication of President Biden. And I do think that's where the pressure is building on our dear bishops to take action for the good of the president's soul and, you know, and just the good of all Catholic faithful. They need to see this witness that the bishops believe that this is the Eucharist, that we need to protect the gift that we were entrusted to as a church last Holy Thursday on the day of the priest and the day of the Eucharist and the bishops mean business. When they stand in the breach and guard the Holy Eucharist from from sin, right? So, yeah, I mean, kudos to Archbishop, and we pray that he, he he's got to go farther though. He just does. Yeah, Canon nine fifteen is uh is what is a code of canon law, which needs to be utilized against a lot of our politicians. And what it does. It, it, it prevents them. It's an interdict which would prevent them from receiving Holy Communion, which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, if they're teaching or promoting through legislation things that are intrinsically evil, and if they're doing this with full knowledge and deliberate consent to the will. They need to be, uh, this, they need to be interdicted or excommunicated. Canon 915 needs to be applied. That's what it's there for. For non-Catholics watching the show, you're like, "What does? Yeah, what is excommunication?" Jesse explained it. Uh, it you know, it goes to what Saint Paul said. If basically, if you drink, if if and if you're in a state of, of grave sin, and you take the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, you drink your own condemnation. Okay, so think about it like this: there is a there is a glass of water. This is water, not beer. <laughs> and it, imagine if this was full of poison. Okay, and your best friend was about to take this and he was going to drink this okay uh the act of excommunication would be tantamount to a bishop seeing his best friend about to drink this thing of poison not that the eucharist is poison itself but what the damage does to the soul is poisonous right so the bishop would run over there stop his friend and say don't drink this i forbid you to drink this drink because it's you're going to be drinking your own condemnation as saint paul said that's a, I, that's what excommunication is. Basically, we want you to partake of the holy body and blood of the Lord, but you got to get your soul clean. Get the evil one out because that will torment you if you take him, right? So it's about love, and we ask our bishops to step up and love this man, this son of the church, Joseph R. Biden. By the way, uh, St. Paul demonstrated excommunication in 1 Corinthians. I, I think it's in chapter 5. There was, he says, one of you is sleeping with uh, your your wife's, uh, your, your father's wife. And he says, uh, he basically, he says, uh, remove him from the community. Get rid of him. That's the Corinthian community. St. Paul also, to Timothy, he tells him about these other two people that are teaching heresy, Hymenaeus and Philetus. In 2 Timothy 2.14, he says, they have swerved from the truth. By holding that the resurrection is past already, they are upsetting the foundation of some. And uh, he goes on and excommunicates them as well. So you have the power. Uh, St. Peter excommunicated a couple for withholding, uh, for lying. They were going to give money to the apostles, and they lied and withheld their money. That excommunication didn't go too well. They dropped dead. 
they that and that's exactly that's exactly what it is. It's it's literally excommunicated to to keep them away from the faithful until they're they're healed. Not that they're evil people, but they need to have their souls uh, cleansed with the sanctifying grace of confession, right? Um, so that it's a big story, you know. And again, always turn this into an opera. It's a scandal, yes, right. But the way we see this, like one of our team was on Newsmax this past weekend talking about this. Uh, you know, this, this thing going on on Easter Sunday and use it as an opportunity because what the other side is ultimately doing, they are testing us. They're taunting us. Do you guys really believe like we're going to spit on your holiest day of the year? What are you going to do? Okay. It's like a little kid. Yeah. You know, we've seen little kids when they're just learning limits, they press their parents till they get a reaction. Okay. Uh, they're saying Catholics, what are we going to do about this? Right? So flip this this is an opportunity for us to get engaged and say no and push back and retake the public square for christ we got another hot topic coming up uh we're gonna take a quick break and we'll see uh see you after the pause you're catholics for catholics catholics for catholics catholics for catholics catholics for catholics which i love that name it's a great blunt political name this organization we are just getting started we are catholics and we are americans both of those characterizations impart a duty and a responsibility did you know that 87 years ago today Pius XI published the encyclical divini redemptoris which condemned atheistic communism and placed the vast campaign of the church against communism under the standard of St. Joseph, the husband of Mary, the father of Jesus Christ. The United States of America will not bow to social, cultural Marxism. Traditional Catholics, their crime, having pro-life, pro-Second Amendment beliefs. In the FBI's view, that made them domestic terrorists. The cross and the flag married together in a holy matrimony of freedom. If we stand for Jesus, we must stand for his children. I believe that if every man were to defend life, I don't believe abortion would exist. If you are baptized as a Catholic, you will live as a Catholic, you will die as a Catholic, and I am proud of my Catholic faith. You cannot become the president of the United States unless you've got the Catholic vote. President Trump is the only Catholic option. How would they have gone after that man? And he stands and keeps going. We are gathered here tonight at the home of the most pro-life president this country has ever seen. When Donald J. Trump is rightfully restored to the presidency. President Trump understood a nation made up of strong families that educate their children to serve God that rejects tyrants. We will finish this night with the consecration of the country and the President Trump and the First Lady, consecration and the intercession of St. Joseph, that they will be protected in the name of Jesus Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Through the power that belongs to the husband, the blessed mother, foster father of Jesus Christ. Let us go and deliver that Catholic vote for the greatest president in our lifetime. God bless America, and God bless President Donald Trump. That was our uh, latest footage from Marlaga, which our editor was on the money. He already inserted that in there, and just that brought back a lot of memories. Of just like two weeks ago, when we had the chance to stand in Marlago to make the the clear statement that President Donald Trump is the only Catholic option. If you haven't seen that that footage, it's well worth it. Go on our websites, on our socials, and just watch and get inspired. Okay. Uh, it's not wasn't a canonization ceremony saying everything that th that he does is perfect. It's not the point. But here's the point: we are in the world. Okay, we have a binary choice on November eighth. There are two options: a choice between socialism, American uh, republic. Okay, and it's clear the church has spoken affirmatively again and again on what communism is and does, and the church on the on the flip side has always supported an American republic. Which is support, which is which is uh, un, built on a foundation of faith and morals. Okay, clear choice in November. You got to get involved, and you can't sit it out. Okay, that was what we. That's what we were up to, Marlago. Now, I want to go into mention, our second topic. Okay, of today. Mention, yeah, that event. Just so you know, and I'm a lot older than you are. It was the most inspirational 
political event I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot of political events, a lot. That one was the most inspirational, informative. It was very clear the binary choices. We're entering into communism. It's already here. Or freedom. And each of the speakers hit it out of the park. Uh, they, they built upon each other. I'm sharing that video with Everybody I can. People call me up. They text me. They go, Jess, that was the most inspirational thing I've ever seen when it comes to politics, the way the Catholic faith was infused in there. And they said, I can't believe you were right there on ringside. I said, man, I had a front row seat. It absolutely did. And it was inspiring for all. It, it's like God said that God has set the political situation up in such a way that it's like perfect for our faith to come in and say, Hey, we can see this clearly from a million miles away. We know what's going on here. This is communism, right? We have the church to stand on on 200 years of tradition from the, the Holy fathers. And we have our ladies warning admonition at Fatima about communism. It's clear as day. And not only do we have the sight to know what's going on, but we also have the weapons to fight this namely the rosary, which is why we ended the night with the Holy Rosary. So yeah, all of us were inspired. It's been a triggering point. It's blown up social media uh, in terms of views. And uh, it's it, this is good. We need this, okay? And I, and I also do know that President Trump himself was very much aware of the event uh, and was sorry he couldn't be there. Um, but he, he is so grateful. I know this personally for what he for what Catholics are doing for him behind the scenes to really pray for him. He needs it. He's going through so much right now as he fights for this country. Yep. Speaking of fighting for this country, okay, uh, we got a problem going on. We all know the southern border is a mess and we're being overrun. Okay, that footage about a week and a half ago where literally there was like, as one reporter called it, it was a kamikaze charge, uh, bonsai charge. Of, of just people slamming into the thing, you know. We also it was even this even the the liberal sites covered that images right. The Texas at Eagle Pass was assaulting the the guard, which which by the way yesterday, guess what? Go figure. Did the photo Ching? They uh, they released those people back who who assaulted our our national guard at the southern border, and they're they're back free, scotch free, right? So it's a mess. We have millions. Uh, coming across this border like crazy, okay? Uh, and even a new report uh, that I was listening to from Todd Benzman yesterday talked about the, the reality. We, we only have numbers of people coming to the southern border, but a way that they've been able to disguise the amount of people coming in, that it, the, they, meaning the federal government, is that they have also, behind our backs, been flying people, not from the Texas border, Across the United States, but they're already doing that. We know that through NGOs like Catholic Charities. But they are basically giving carte blanche uh, opportunities for people that are living in, let's just say, uh, I don't know, South Africa or whatever other country to take a flight from there and then flying them to whatever state directly and just dropping them off at our U.S. international airports. Oh, yeah. Number one state for the record that they're doing this for in this case was Florida. All right. So that means like you don't you don't need uh, visas. You don't need uh, any of that kind of stuff. They give it to you right there. You can if you if you, this time they're paying for their flight. So they actually the 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 immigrants are are paying for their flight, but they get basically a free visa right away and they're just dropped off there at, at the international airport. Right. So we're being we're being invaded, literally being invaded. OK, now going to the story that we, you need to hear about, especially if you're Catholic, is this. We had a situation. We all love our Catholic priests, right? Catholic priests are the they sustain the, they sustain us, right? Especially those who during COVID continue to feed us, right? Spiritually, we need them. Well, you have in this country since the very beginning priests who are not born here, but yet have come here legally to uh, to serve the people, uh, the sacraments, and, and be stationed at parishes across the nation, right? Very, very common right now. We see, especially with the vocation shortage, it's been essential to have these priests. Uh, you know, we've had many from India uh, and other countries like that. Um, but we had it, it got very personal for me about a week ago 
when I was made aware through G General Flynn, uh, and, and I discovered that there was this priest by the name of Father Christoph, is, is Father Chris for short, Chris Frost of St. Martha's Catholic Church in Sarasota, Florida. So here's what's going on. This priest uh, from Poland uh, came to the U.S., has been serving the faithful in the Diocese of, Sar uh, Diocese of Venice and, and in the town of Sarasota and been faithfully doing his thing. He actually he came here on his uh, – he got his visa renewed for three years and he got it renewed again, okay? And then when he was time to, to ask for his uh, green card so he could like stay as a permanent resident, they denied him, right? He has, he has what's called an R1 visa. That's – you basically get that if you go to a different country and you're there for religious purposes to serve the faithful. I actually had one when I went to Italy as a seminarian. I would, I, it was, I got it through the Vatican Secretary of State to be there for religious studies. Okay, so I kind of know how this goes. Uh, this priest had an R1 visa, right? Well, what do you think is going to happen? The Biden administration, geniuses that they are. Um, have decided that they are not making allowances for for R1 visa holders. They're sipping them right back to their countries where they're going to have to wait for a year before they get the possibility of being readmitted in this country. Now, are is the Biden administration legally following the rules? Yes, they are in this situation. That's what you do. You know, you don't have to accept the person after, after they've been here for five years. But anyone with a brain can see it's a it's a total joke. You are sending your religious workers out of the country, and yet you are accepting millions and millions of illegal immigrants, terrorists, or spread out all among them into this country who kill an innocent person like every other day, it seems. Okay? It's something that's not right. So we heard this news, and General Flynn, myself, and Tom Holman um, – wrote an open letter to the bishop. Uh, Jesse, you want to just thoughts on there before I go into the open letter when you when you heard about this situation? John, I'm glad that you guys did this. I'll tell you why because this is this is what's called accountability and this is this is what the catechism actually calls lay people to do. I believe it's in Canon 212 and and CCC 90 Catechism of the Catholic Church paragraph 907 tells lay people to do exactly what you guys did in this letter. You guys are within your canonical rights. Uh, and so kudos to you guys. I'm glad that you, and again, this letter has some weight because it's just not, you know, being written by, uh, you know, by uh, John, yeah. it, it, no, by a lunch pale Catholic, right. you, know, you know, working at 7-Eleven or something. No, General Flynn, Tom Holman and yourself, you guys have have weight, and that's good. And I'm glad because bishops need to hear that lay Catholics with weight in society are telling them, hey, bishop, you're stepping out of bounds. This is wrong. We're calling you on it. As, as our shepherd and as your sheep, we're calling you to accountability. So this letter was well written. I'm glad you guys are doing this. And this is exactly why Catholics for Catholics exist, to do this exactly because – we have to be the moral conscience of some of our church leaders. Yeah, it, it, and we, we want to address it. We, we got to push back and look. We, when we're out of line too, we humbly welcome the bishops, uh, what they say to us and how we can better, right? But we have to speak from truth. And these priests, like the people that perish, they don't have a voice. They love their priest. They need their priest, okay? Uh, America is falling apart, okay? And the worst thing that we could do is to kick out the people that bring us the, the sacraments, which nourish us. So we wrote the following open letter. I'll read you parts of it. Uh, addressed to Bishop Frank DeWayne. Dear Bishop DeWayne, we pray you're having a blessed Holy Week and has come to our attention the plight of a priest of your diocese, Father Chris Frost of St. Martha's Catholic Church in Florida. The State Department is denying this priest a renewal of his R1 visa and green card. Rather than renewing it, they are deporting him at the end of May. Father Christoph is just one among many nationwide who are being sent back to their native countries where they must remain for one year before regi re registering to reenter the USA. It's actually, it's obviously, it's more than him, okay? In fact, I call the parish, like, so I want to get my facts straight, make sure it's not just, like, hokey pokey stuff, right? So I talked to the pastor, you know, in his, in his broken English accent. It wasn't Father Chris, but he said, like, yeah, this is, this is true. This is happening to Father Chris, and, in fact, it's going to happen to me, too. In fact, 
I'll be gone in a year as well. So the St. Paris is going to lose a second priest, okay? The irony of the situation is that while our southern border is wide open and the legal immigration is at an all-time high, we as a country are deporting as a priority the R1 visa holders because we have, quote, reached our quota. In fact, that's that's in fact, the priest told me himself, said, look, yes, the R1 visa holders are being sent out and they're giving preference to, to the countries of Ecuador and Nicaragua and everything like that with the normal visas, okay? Um, and it, again, we love immigration. We love safe immigration and legal immigration, okay? At a time where, where the very moral fiber of this country is being destroyed, we are sending away the very people that bring us the Lord Jesus. While it may seem that these problems belong to the secular realm, we wholeheartedly disagree. The late Pope Benedict was very clear that, quote, while the church cannot and must not take upon herself the political battle to bring about the most just society possible, she at the same time cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. That's from Dave's Caritas Est. Number 28, we are respectfully asking you then, Bishop, not to remain on the sidelines in this fight for justice. And aside from being the shepherd of the diocese, you serve on the subcommittee for the pastoral care of migrants, refugees, and travelers from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, thus magnifying your responsibility to act. We ask that you stand up in private and public addressing secular authorities who have the power to change this. On this Holy Thursday, the day dedicated to the priesthood, we make our plea that you will speak up for this priest and those in similar situations using the platform you've been given by God and the church. Uh, yours in Christ, myself, General Michael Flynn, and Tom Homan. Uh, just three Catholic men, three Catholic men who serve in the political sphere and want to do our part to speak up for the church. And if we, you, if the bishop has done something privately, from what we can tell, there's nothing been done publicly to speak out for this priest. If he's done privately, we'll be the first to, to, to remind everybody that this good shepherd is trying hard to keep this priest there. It has got to be addressed, okay? This is not just a problem for one bishop in Florida. Every single bishop, the same bishops who've taken millions of dollars to basically foster the illegal immigration at the southern border have got to speak up for their own priest. Okay, it's not right. We need to defend them. Something else uh, that most people don't talk about because it's not politically expedient or correct to talk about. But the fact is that, and I know I've read Heritage Foundation and other think tanks. They've actually stated and they've documented that illegal immigrants receive in benefits far more than they pay in taxes. So oh, yeah. that's not, yeah, that's not good for any one of us, John, because what's the, what what that does it breeds in people an entitlement attitude okay that this is owed to me and really entitlement it's a violation of the seventh commandment thou shall not steal and the government steals from us uh you know takes from peter and gives to paul uh that forced redistribution of wealth that's not a gospel principle the gospel principle is People give out of the goodness of their heart, not because the government is twisting your arm. Another thing I want to mention before we go on to the break is that we're a very generous country. Yeah. We're by far the most generous country in the world. I remember a few years ago, uh, Marco Rubio was being interviewed on Fox News, and they were discussing immigration. And he said, and everybody, it was a mic drop moment. He said that a million people a year come into the U.S. legally. No other country even comes close to that figure. It was a mic drop moment. It, it is, and it's been the lifeblood of our country, but we're going to get into deeper of what happens. We want these people, but when they come in through an act of defiance, okay, it changes the whole process, okay, and also fosters all the other crazy stuff at the southern border, right? So we'll get into that after the break. Stay tuned. This is the Catholics for Catholics weekly show. Attacks on Catholic churches in America are up. The memo calls for the FBI to develop sources within Catholic congregations. How many FBI agents would, with guns would you estimate showed up at your house? 
Opponents fear such a declaration would weaponize communion and weaken the bishop's ability to speak on other issues. The Dodgers reversing course after backlash from fans, elected officials, and members of the LGBTQ plus community. The team has officially reinvited the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. This is because what? Because Catholics don't tend to march in the streets. They wrote a letter via Marco Rubio, one of our most famous Catholics. But that's it. We're, we're not going to threaten them. We're not going to be vicious the way these trans activists are. Um, that's not the way we tend to behave, and they know it. They are marching to the entrance of the stadium. They will not be going into the game. The first pitch is at 7.15, and again, the Sisters of Perpetual uh, Indulgence will be honored tonight. They will be receiving the Hero Community Award, and it doesn't sit well with this particular group. We need to live our martyrdom. We need to live as those ready to die and ready to live for the blood that was shed for us all. We need to be audacious. It's kind of a fancy word, but it means be strong enough to speak for what you believe. And we need to do that. I just want to thank you from the bottom of our heart. Gracias por tus oraciones y por tu gran participación. Prepárate para seguir construyendo el reino de Cristo en los Estados Unidos de América. Católicos para católicos, vamos por mucho más. Jesus Christ is King. And his mother is our mother. We are not called to flee the world, to run away when things are difficult. But as devout and faithful Roman Catholics, Catholic Christians, we are to renew our country, our world, our state. But I know where our country is at. I know what it's going to take. And for anybody that's been following me or listening to me, and I, I use the phrase local action equals a national impact. Local action has a national impact. What does that mean? That means now every single American has to stand up, step up, and speak up. We are back. Final segment of the show. Uh, picking right up again with this whole immigration thing and how it's just, it's as the, the polls show, it's the number one thing on people's minds across America as we head into this election. It's the border, okay? And everything that happens that flows from it. It's not just a, the influx of people in this country. It translates into the inflation that you're seeing right now, uh, which is so rampant. I mean, regular day Americans are just really, really struggling, okay? We're struggling to make ends meet. Um, you know, I, I think about, um, uh, my thought goes to like the, the Catholic teachers, right. You know, they don't make that much as it is compared to like public schools and what this is doing. They're trying to like sacrifice themselves to teach our kids and the inflation's going up, gas, food, everything. And it's just, it, it's hurting the Americans who work so hard to, to build it, to make this country great. Uh, and we, we got to speak up for them. Right. So I just a, a story coming from that uh, is you, you, maybe you've heard this by now is this whole thing that's going on with the squatting rights. Okay, uh, we have insane laws. Go figure in this country where in so, some states, many states actually, you can basically go to a, a vacant house and just set up shop. And if you're there for a little bit, like you know, the owner cannot remove you. Okay, so go figure. You had one of these migrants who picked up on this and I don't blame them in some ways to pick up on the absurdity, but, but it's, it is troubling his video. I'm, 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 here's the story. TikToker tells this is from the New York post. It was covered all over a uh, second of news last week. TikToker tells illegal immigrants how to invade American homes and invoke squatters rights. A migrant TikToker with a, half a million strong online following is offering his comrades 
tips on how to invade unoccupied homes and invoke squatters' rights in the United States after they just invaded the country. Venezuelan national Leonel Moreno, who appears to live in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, said in a recent video that under U.S. law, quote, the house is not inhabited, we can seize it. He appears to be re referring to adverse possession laws, commonly known as squatters' rights, which allow unlawful property occupants' rights over the property they occupy without the owner's consent in certain circumstances. Moreno claimed in the viral TikTok clip, which now has drawn more than 3.9 million views. That was last week's, probably like 5 million, like 5 million views, okay? That he has taken, that he has, quote, his African friends who have already taken about seven homes. Uh, it goes on the article. Um, the firebrand influencer, Jesse, comments on that before I go farther. What do you think about that? Uh, th this is what I just talked about before. It's, it's, uh, this is breeding a generation of entitlement. This is not good for us. This is not good for the country. And remember, uh, an, this entitlement mentality, this is a violation of the seventh commandment for us as Catholics. Uh, and, and all of this come, all this entitlement, gimme, 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 these freebies, it all comes from Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society. And we're seeing it play out right now, John. 100% we are in this devastating consequence. They're laughing at us, right? I mean, this... I mean, the guy, this guy's face is just the face of just total anger and rage. It's, it, it's, it's kind of creepy, actually. This, the firebrand, the firebrand influencer who lives with his partner and their baby daughter argue that the only way for his fellow migrants to escape living on the streets, not become a public burden, is to invade unoccupied homes. Many TikTok commenters were outraged by Moreno's message encouraging squatting, which has emerged. As a major problem in recent years across the U.S., especially Democrat-led cities, New York, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Chicago. I mean, it's they have brought it upon themselves, right? Uh, reminds me of the quote, blood be upon us and upon our children. I mean, like, that's what's happened, right? You, that video was released uh, a couple, I think it was yesterday, where it, they caught the audio of some Democrat mayors complaining and begging the migrants who I think they, who had showed up in Denver to go to the more liberal other liberal cities like Chicago, so they were like begging you know these are the same buffoons that had wanted quote unquote you know uh, sanctuary cities for all these people right so it's it's a human rights crisis. It was one of the issues that we spoke up about in more non negotiable for Catholics to defend our southern border and defend the rights of the kids. Because hundreds and thousands of them are being trafficked because of the chaos at the southern border. And millions of Americans are dying on our streets from the drug crisis, which is basically China is using fentanyl, pumping it through the southern border to kill Americans. You thought COVID was bad? Fentanyl is killing millions more. It is a Chinese invasion, okay? It, it's 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 insane. I don't, we have no idea the 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 consequences yet of this of this border crisis. John, this and, and and all this that we're describing right now, this is an entitlement mentality, which with John F. Kennedy back in 1961, he would have stood against this. He gave a very famous speech, and he said he said, "And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you." Ask what you can do for your country. Think about that. Today, the, the entitlement Democrats, they teach minorities to see what this country can do for you, not what you can do for this country. That's the exact opposite of John F. Kennedy's vision for America back in 1961. Also, talking about uh, this, uh, the ramifications of illegal immigration open borders and or broken borders. And one of the Anstegi, one of the producers of the movie, The Sound of Freedom, he, he said, and, and I heard this lecture, I was there sitting right, right uh, in the audience with Carrie Lake and others. Uh, Eduardo came a year ago and he said that Mexico, number one, is the largest exporter of child sex trafficking in the world, number one. Number two, he said, 
and I took copious notes. He said, the U.S. is the largest consumer of child sex trafficking. Number three, he said, 80% of women that come across the southern border are raped. And after the women are raped, the Mexican cartels hang the underwear of the victim on a tree branch or bush. There are thousands of women's underwears and bras hanging on trees in the deserts of the U.S. Southwest Territory. And finally, Eduardo said that human trafficking is so profitable, it's an $150 billion business, and that's what this movie was exposing. What Jeffrey Epstein was doing on his island is truly an international diabolical problem, and right now, the ground zero is Mexico. It's... It's absolutely true, and this is why it's so maddening that the Mexican president said yesterday to Biden laughing at us basically like, you want us to shut down the southern border? You got to pay us like $20 billion or something crazy. Trump was all over it, thankfully, speaking out for us again, but it's it's a crisis. And I want to go deeper into what this is doing to the American psyche in terms of our charity towards the migrant. Okay, so traditionally, 1800s, early 1900s, what happens? You have all this influx of people coming through Ellis Island including my ancestors, right, coming through there uh, the legal way. And you had the church or, or Catholics who, out of the kindness of their heart, gave to these people. It was not government handouts that saved them, okay? Well, here's here's now the flip side. You have people like this Lionel Moreno guy who's online just talking about how he's going to take your home. Do you think people are going to want to give charitably to this guy? He's got a daughter. He's got a wife. No. It, 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 they come to invade. They come in a spirit of defiance. They come because they had stolen. It's going to it's gonna kill natural charity. People are going to be like, what? You're getting more money from the government. Basically, my money, the government's taking my money through taxes and giving it back to you, and I don't, I don't think they have a choice. Do you think they're going to give anything else to them? No. Zero. Unless you're like super heroic, saintly, right? But it's gonna, it, you know, government <clears throat> handout, <clears throat> government handouts essentially kills spontaneous free charity, which is the best form of all, right? That's why Americans always have been the most generous with our funds, right? Because we have that natural Christian spirit with us. But this, this is this is destroying that, and it's creating two enemies here, right? You having um, it's class warfare again. Communism of its own right. You're having two classes here: those who have come in legally and those who have not. And that's it's a war brewing to happen. And they come in. That's why they come in already with so much anger. And that's why we saw Lincoln Riley, which is murder, innocent, 22 year old nurse uh, in Georgia, just taking a freaking jog after one of her exams and was just murdered for no reason. Had no connection to this mic. It's happening all over. You had those five thugs. Who beat the crap out of that New York police officer? Okay, and it, it, they were let off scotch free. It's a disaster, and thank God President Trump is going to try to fix this. You know, all, all of this stems from uh, this uh, strategy that the Democrats use. It's called the Cloward Pivens method. You have a uh, these are two political ab- activists. You have Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. Back in 1966, they created this strategy. What is it? And by and Obama's has used this masterfully, and so has Biden. The idea behind the, the Cloward Piven strategy is to overload the US public welfare system and create crises all over the country. As you create a crisis, what is that? What is that? What happens? Well, you've got to grow government that way you ha- so to take care of the crisis. So they set up the problem so they can grow government. And so the, the, the point is, is to overwhelm the government to the, to the point where all these other bureaucracies start growing and it's going to end up being replaced by a, a, a welfare system, a socialist system of, of, for example, a guaranteed annual income, uh, guaranteed housing. Uh, these are the things that the Cloward Pivens method they're pushing towards to end poverty, the war on poverty. This is being done purposefully. 
I'm glad you highlighted that. I was, I think Charlie Kirk also talked about that, Jesse. I, and I was unaware of that whole theory, but it, it makes complete sense. It's, it's, it's a designed crisis that they, that's been in the works for a long time. And we're seeing the, the fruition of this. And it all goes back as we close this show. When Jesus Christ removed that demon from that individual, I'm slipping on, who, on, on the circumstances, his w uh, words of warning to that person was, if you don't fill that, with something else, seven more demons will come and take your place. Okay. What we have right now in the public square, when, we, when the country was given birth in 1776, we were given again. It was like God removed a demon, right? We were given this great gift. The problem is slowly over time, we've let seven more demons take that spot. We've, we have removed Jesus from the public square in public discussion such that you have the president Catholic in name who's able to go on Easter Sunday and declare that the day of transgender visibility. Okay. That's what we're talking about. We've left the public square and we're letting ourselves be railroaded. However, there's good news. Catholics are on the march and we're pushing back and we're going to keep doing that. And that's out in, in itself is a blessing in disguise because every, every generation to quote John Paul II, who passed away 24 years ago today or 20, I'm going to 19 years ago today. 19 years ago today, JP2 passed away. He reminded one of his books that freedom is it has to be fought for at every single generation. And that is a task before us now as Catholics in this country to be armed with the sacraments in a state of grace to be winning the souls for Christ. That is a wrap. This is the Catholics for Catholics show. Thank you for joining. We will see you next week.